Ja, schönen guten Morgen, kann man noch sagen, zu unserem Web-Talk zum Thema Forschungsdatenmanagement in der Informatik. Welcome to our Web Talk, uh, Two Perspectives on Research Data Management. Mein Name ist äh, Nikolaus Becker, ich bin, äh, arbeite bei der Gesellschaft für Informatik in der Geschäftsstelle und äh, ich will Ihnen einen ganz kurzen Überblick über unser Programm geben, was wir für die nächste Stunde haben. Wir hören zunächst einen Vortrag von Herrn Professor Roberto Di Cosmo, Direktor der Software Heritage Foundation mit dem Titel Towards Software as a First Class Citizen in the Scholarly World with Software Heritage. Dann haben wir nur ganz kurze fünf Minuten Zeit, um eventuelle Fragen zu klären oder Anmerkungen äh, von Ihnen zu hören. Und im Anschluss werden Ihnen unsere äh, GI-Vizepräsidentinnen äh, Ulrike Lucke und Michael Gödicke in einem kurzen Vortrag das neue Konsortium NFDI für und mit, äh, also nationale Forschungsdateninfrastruktur für und mit Computer Science vorstellen. Dann haben wir noch einmal ähm, 15 Minuten Zeit, um Fragen zu klären und ähm, Ihre Kommentare aufzunehmen. Und äh, das war es dann auch für diesen Web-Talk. Ich würde Sie bitten, Fragen ähm, über die äh, Fragefunktion bzw. den Chat hier im GoToMeeting-System zu stellen. Ähm, und äh, ich werde die dann vorlesen bzw. ähnliche Fragen versuchen, äh, sinnhaft zusammenzufassen. Wenn Sie Fragen an Herrn äh, Di Cosmo haben, ähm, wäre es hilfreich, wenn Sie die direkt auf Englisch stellen können. Wenn sich die Fragen ausschließlich auf das Konsortium bzw. auf den Vortrag von Herrn Gödicke und Frau Lucke beziehen, können Sie gerne auch auf Deutsch fragen. So much uh, for the home meeting. Uh, very happy to hand over to you, Roberto. Thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for having me with you today. Can, can you see my slides? We can see them perfectly. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, first of all, a few words about me. I'm a computer science professor. I have been, I have been teaching uh, and doing research in computer science for some 30 years. I have been very active in the open source movement for some 20 years and some 10 years ago I started to dedicate my time and energy to build the infrastructure for the common good. And the last one is software heritage, and we are going to talk about this today. But let me start with a little bit of, um, of an overview of where we stand. We all know as computer scientists and technologists that software is actually uh, at the, it, it's a key infrastructure for all our modern work today. But what many people do not uh, see is that source code of the software is a key knowledge inside the software that runs our world. When I was a student many years ago, I would use the book by Harold Abelson, uh, Structural Interpretation of Computer Programs. And in the first pages, it was written this very interesting phrase. I mean, programs must be written for people to read, and only incidentally for machines to execute. Well, of course, we want to run programs. Okay? You want to play your game or run your simulation. But the, the point is that, uh, that, that Harold wanted to uh, make is that actually these problems are written by people for other people who will need to understand them, evolve them, maintain them, and fix them over time. Okay? And if you do not have the source code, you cannot do that. But in the 80s, this was a kind of a cryptic message because there was not much software to be seen in the world. But today, 30 years later, uh, uh, 35 years later, we have an incredible amount of beautiful pieces of source code that we can look at. Some pieces are very old, like this uh, small excerpt that you see here from the source code of the Apollo 11 guidance computer with, with very interesting comments that you see on, on the right. I mean, that's a piece of the software which is actually asking the astronaut to turn around the landing module to make sure you, you put the, the, the foot on the moon and you do not crash on it. And uh, you can have other beautiful pieces of software which are more recent, like for example, this is uh, the, the, the very famous routine which is used to compute one over square root of x. When you have a very flaky uh, floating point coprocessor, you, you want to do it without doing floating point operations. Uh, I will not comment on this, it would take a full afternoon to understand what is going on. I mean, these are very beautiful pieces of software. And so, 
Ezelin Schustek, who is a board director of the Computer History Museum, famously said in a beautiful article in 2006, well, the source code of the software provides a view into the mind of the designer. It's, it's essential for us to understand what a piece of computer software actually does. Well, this is a general remark, okay? But when you move to the world of science, you, you are all very well aware that there is this global movement to go towards open science where open is all over the place. In particular, we are fighting to get back control of our own scientific publication. This is the open access movement. Then there is a, a awareness of the need to have access also to the data which is used in the articles that we published, and, and this brings to open data. And then there is a late camera, I mean, and, and another very, very important pillar of open science, which is the source code of the software used here that has been forgotten for too long. Okay, so there, there are actually really three pillars in doing open science. The articles, the data, and the software. And well, once we know that, uh, we can ask ourselves, why do we need the source code and what can we do with the source code of software in general when there are many needs if we are a, if you are a researcher i am a researcher well actually i need a place where i can archive the software used in my article making sure it will stay there can be accessed and referenced for later reuse or verification uh, even by myself maybe in two weeks and two years i, I need a place where i can find useful software of course then uh, I, in academia, I want to get credit for the software that I develop, if possible. I mean, in my career evaluation and promotions, I want people to look at what I did and take it into consideration. And of course, when I look for uh, at articles written by my colleagues, I want to be able to, to verify what they did, to reproduce it, maybe to build on top of what they did and to improve their results. So these are basic needs of the researchers. But there are also needs for a team or for a lab. There you need uh, the team or the lab to actually be able to track the, the, the contribution to produce reports. Unfortunately, we have to produce tons of reports and uh, to have an up-to-date web page with your contribution or something like this. And then if you go up at the level of a university or research organization, uh, they need to know what are the software assets they are contributing to. This is important for many, many different reasons, including, for example, studying whether there is technology transfer, which is possible, or uh, uh, building, unfortunately, impact metrics. I say unfortunately because you know what happens when you have metrics. When, when, when a metric becomes a target, it is no longer a good metric. Huh? This is a well-known law, but unfortunately, this is how the world works. But once you know all this and you try to address all these needs, you will discover that actually you basically need four different things. Okay, and this is what is at stake. I'm presenting these four different issues in what I believe to be an increasing order of difficulty. You, you, are, free to you are free to disagree, of course. So let, let, let me just say why I see things like this. The first thing you need an archive. You need a place where you can put your software and make sure, make sure it doesn't go away. And development platforms are not archived. Okay? I mean, this is important to make sure we can retrieve this software for reproducibility later on. After all, this may seem easy, huh? okay? You put a zip or a tar file somewhere in some archive somewhere, it doesn't seem that complicated. It is more complicated than that, but I mean. Then you need identification. How do I identify the real exact version that I'm using, which is in archive somewhere? Again, this is important for reproducibility. Getting this right, again, is not easy, but it, we know how to do it. We will go to this later on. Then you need to describe software properly. And they pretend that this is more complicated. It is needed because without proper metadata, you cannot discover or reuse properly the software. They pretend it is more complicated because metadata, if you look around, you will find there are 40, 50 different ontologies around for describing software. Nobody really agrees on how to do it. So it's more messy. And finally, even more complicated, I mean, getting proper credit out of the software that you build or contribute to, that this requires citation to work. And citation is not the same as reference. A reference is just a handle to get the copy of the software. Citation is means understanding who is the author, who should be credited, for what role. And so this is more a political thing. So it's, it's more complicated to do. These are the four issues you need. So archival, 
reference describe, describe, description and uh, citation for credit. So if you want to do this properly, we need an infrastructure which is designed for software source code, not just take any kind of uh, existing infrastructure and drop pieces of source code in there. Well, the good news is that today, now we have one such infrastructure that can help with this for uh, issue, particularly the first two, archive and identification. I believe today we know how to do this properly. And so this is where enters Software Heritage, which is the uh, project I, I have created some five years ago and I'm directing right now. So what is Software Heritage? In a nutshell, this is an initiative that has a very precise mission, which is to go out there collect the source code of every single piece of software ever written, which is publicly available today, everything. Make sure we do not lose it, preserve it, and make sure it is easily accessible, share it. So this is not just the past. It is not just the Apollo 11 source code we have seen, okay? It is also the software you write today and, and building a kind of uh, uh, infrastructure that allows us to better understand what is going on and to prayer, prepare better software and better science for all for tomorrow. So it is the past, the present, and the future. And so to, to give you a, a couple of, two, three uh, images of what we are doing, we are building a reference catalog. Uh, what is a reference catalog? Of course, we have a lot of software source code going around the world today. Many people use GitHub, but others use Google code. And Old guys like me remember SourceForge, which was the first one, but there are people using Bitbucket and then you have your own institutional repository and turns out tons of things like this, but we do not have a catalog. Okay, the best approximation to a catalog we have today is a search engine, which is not a catalog. Then we are building an archive. I mean, all the platform you have seen in the previous uh, 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 image here and the tag cloud like GitHub, et cetera, they are not archived, they are development platforms. We go there to work together on something but the project can be created, removed, deleted, renamed, uh, display, misplaced. There is no guarantee that it will stay there. Okay, so an archive is important. What we build in storage is an archive. What comes in, stays in. And finally, this is the first brick into a research infrastructure that we need to build, we directly need to build to be able to explore the galaxy of software development around the world today. So we as mankind have been able to invest billions of dollars and euros to build beautiful pieces of infrastructure like telescopes, space telescopes, particle accelerators, because we want to know, we want to learn about what is around us in nature. And this is beautiful. Now we as computer science, as technologies, we need to build an infrastructure to explore the galaxy of software development. It is not there yet. We would like to see it come. And software is just the first brick in building such an infrastructure. So software in, in our philosophy is built like an infrastructure, as I said again. So we want to support the creation of application in a range of different spaces, from cultural heritage, that's the reason we have an agreement with UNESCO, to industry, that's the reason you will see we have many industry sponsors, for research, for research as a whole, and for researchers in computer sciences, you will see we have university research organization on board, and for education. So we do not want to build application for any of these. I mean, the products will come later. We are building the infrastructure on top of which such application can be done. And if you look at what we have done already up to now, we already built the largest archive of source code ever uh, made. So over 140 million projects which are archived in a special market graph, we will see this, uh, that allows to deduplicate everything. And so we have actually today over 9 billion individual different source files which are in the archive. Okay. Now, uh, uh, part of our strategy, of course, is to be an infrastructure and do not lose things. One of the reasons why we uh, uh, design this as an open system is that I do not believe anybody can maintain an infrastructure for the long term alone. So that's the reason why we built in the philosophy, in the organization of software heritage, the openness from the bottom up. And one of the parts of openness is that we have a mirror program in place 
because you see, I mean, if you look at this citation of an American president, which was a little bit wiser than the one we see today, I mean, uh, uh, this is a letter written at the end of, uh, uh, of the revolution where uh, some fires were destroying some precious part of the documents there. And Thomas Jefferson was writing to a person who sent one of these documents to him and asking him uh, how, how you can preserve it. Look at these beautiful things. Uh, he says, I mean, yes, if we want to avoid to lose these things, the, the good solution is not to have a single vault where you lock things, but to have many copies in such a way that even an accident cannot destroy them all. And that's the reason why we are building a mirror network. And, and, and uh, we signed an agreement last year with ENEA, which is a national Italian agency for new technologies, which is the first institutional mirror. And I hope it will be the first of many others that need to be uh, built around the world to maintain a full copy of the archive we are building. But well, now let me get back and how software heritage is actually addressing these four needs we mentioned. So archive, reference, describe, site. For archive, we are building this gigantic archive in a very special way. So we do not wait for you to come to us and deposit your software. We actually go out there and fetch it proactively from many different places. We archive Guitar, we archive Bitbucket, we archive gitlab.com, we are archiving NPM, Package Manager, something like this, and there are so many others to add. Huh? So it's not an easy job. Uh, and we need to build adapter for each of these platforms because there is no standard. It's not as easy as archiving the web. Okay, we, You need to understand the semantics of what happens on the platform. And once you get to talk to each of these platforms, <clears throat> then you discover that there are so many different version control systems, so many different package management systems, so many different formats. Uh, we, we do not stop there. We do not just make a copy of a particular package format or a particular version control system. We go the extra mile to actually transform all of this into a single gigantic direct acyclic graph, a Merkle graph that contains uh, all the file contents, all the directories, all the releases, all the versions, all the commits, etc., in a uniform data structure. So this builds a, the, the universal graph of software development around the world. Because this is needed for long-term preservation, I cannot expect you to have the right version or subversion of Git or Mercurial in 20 years, but it is also a beautiful uh, object of study. So this is how we build the archive, but we also allow you to proactively trigger archival in, in, uh, in uh, software heritage. So you can point our harvester to a particular repository. And we have a deposit interface, which is reserved in particular for scholarly repositories. And we are working with journals or different other repositories to enable them to deposit contents directly into the archive. So this is the archival part. And you will notice this is not a traditional archival. Each software project is not in a box by its own with label. It is included, converted into this gigantic Merkle tree that allows you to know whether a single file has been used in two or three or 1,000 different projects, one move from one place to, to the other. You see, it's much, much more advanced. Then for reference, how do you reference a piece of code in such a way that you can ensure it is the right one you had in your paper at a given moment in time. Well, of course, uh, you can use any of the usual identifiers you find in the scholarly space, but we are computer scientists, right? So we know how we work every day with decentralized version control system. And so we apply the same techniques. So the identifier we provide, which are the software heritage identifier, are based on cryptographic hashes, properly tagged with proper effect, prefix and version numbers of the algorithm which is used for the hashing. It is now supported in industrial standard, which is SPDX, the software package data exchange format. It is supported in Wikidata. There is a property in there. I will not spend too much time on on this, uh, uh, now we, we show you a small demo if, if I manage with this uh, video conferencing system in a few minutes. But just remember, so archive is done in the proper way for software and reference is done in the proper way for software. Okay, we, we do not adopt other technology unrelated to software. We build the ones and use the ones which are designed for software. 
These are our core missions, archive and reference, but we also contribute to others' uh, aspects to so describe how do we help describing. So we try to extract intrinsic metadata from source code. There is a lot, you know, the dependencies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we did contribute to a, 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 a piece of software to generate a, a metadata format, which is called Code Meta, which is getting some traction uh, to help people write metadata. And also for credit and citation, again, it's not our core business here, but it is important. So I took some time to actually develop uh, a, a, a bibliotic extension that allows you to cite software properly. It is now on CTAN in Tech Live. You can use it right away, and it can it allows you to cite software, software versions, software modules, and even code fragments properly in your papers. So uh, let me move on a little bit. So this is how we actually try to address these four needs. But let me remember you what we are doing. This is actually more than that. It is a kind of a revolutionary infrastructure for software source code because you have the graph of software development in a, in a single graph, you hold the story. And because we have built this graph for our long-term needs, we also did the normalization phase that you usually need when you do machine learning or big code analysis. Okay? So you have a one uniform data structure where all the history of computing is actually stored, no matter what is the version control system, the package manager, or the place where it has been developed. So this is a beautiful object to actually do a, a massive analysis for a ton of reason. I mean, software quality, security, safety, etc. And actually, if you are curious, the, uh, the slides will be shared later on. Uh, the first data set extracted from this are actually available. We're running a mining competition this year, a few months ago. Uh, so you, you will be able to click on these papers to learn more if you want. So th that was a general picture for you of what is going on. But now I would like, if I manage, I'm sorry, let me try if this works. So if I go, if I go here, is it visible? Join main screen, yes. This. It seems that it works. You, you see the main screen, right? Uh, you, screen. Okay. So what you see here is that the, the main page of our archive, not, not, not the front shop. I mean, let, let me show you. I mean, if, if I click here, if you go to www.sotrage.org, this is the, 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 the front shop. I mean, we, we explain what we do, the mission, you have nice picture, etc. but since we are uh, among us. I'm going to the, the real thing, okay, behind the, behind the front shop. So here you have the list of all the uh, uh, platform we are already archiving, Bitbucket, Debian, GitHub, GitLab, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, by the way, I do not know if you remember, Google Code and Gitorios were shut down in 2015, over one million and a half project in danger, where we saved them. You, you have find the copy of everything right here. And you see the current situation, over 9 billion unique source files archived, over 100 million, 140 million project archived. And then you can actually search, search. You can, let me see if I can use this. Pitch, search. Uh, oh. See, this is a very simple search engine for the moment. We would need more sophisticated tools, but this will take more time and more resources. You can click uh, on the URL of a project that has been archived. For example, this is the piece of the source code of the Apollo 11 I showed to you. And then you, you see you can actually navigate inside the archive like you would in, in a, a, in a um, uh, normal uh, collaborative development platform. It is built for developers, by developers. And you see, for example, here there is a beautiful piece that I love to, to show of the source, Apollo 11 source code, where actually the engineers in the 60s were developing this part uh, of the code, which turns on and off the, the engines. And so it is very sensitive. 
And here they say, you see, the master initial team was conceived and executed by these two guys. Only Swaki Magi Parents, they say, I mean, shame on you if you don't, don't like what we did. I mean, try to do better than what we did. And then here there are the table with the numbers that come in, and you see now they resort to Latin. So, null is a tangere. Don't touch unless you know what you are doing. Now, I would like to show this segment of the code to a friend of mine, okay? or put it in a paper, or put it in a, in, a, in a reference, in a documentation. Then it's easy. I go to this permalink section here. And here you see, this is the intrinsic identifier for this file. So the hash code of the file we're showing, it is a content, the file content, version one of the hashing algorithm for the software heritage standard. But I can add all this contextual information that tells you actually where this has been find, found, uh, what was the state of the repository when it was visited last time, what is the node with respect to which we provide the path the deeds to the particular file with the file name and the lines of code. So if I copy this permanent here and uh, how do I build a new tab? And I click on it and I'm simulating the click by just passing the identifier in the, in the browser. What happens is you will be brought to the uh, archive exactly in front of the same piece of code and in exactly the same context. You see here the same revision, the same file name that you see, etc. So you, you find exactly the same view in the archive that the person that created the link actually wanted you to see and was seeing. So now let's see if I move back from this. How do I move back from this? Okay. And I go back to my presentation. Uh, Okay, so if I go back to my presentation, it was a very short demo because I do not have too much time to, to, to show you, but I could show you papers or other things that are built like this. Since I do not have time, I have prepared this slide here. So just please click everything which is in blue is actually a link that brings you to a particular example of how these uh, things are used in many, many different ways uh, today. But at least I wanted to give you a feeling of what the archive looks like. And of course, you can you can trigger save code now very, very easily, but again, don't have time to go through this right now. What I would like to tell you a bit more is about the way forward and why I'm so happy to be with you today talking about all this. Because, you know, even if I say we built it, our effort, when I say we and when I say our, this is not me. It is not my team. It is not even INRIA, which is my institution. It is we as a community in computing. I mean, this is something we as a community need to do. And and, and would really like to see all of you taking part in this effort. So let, let's move to the way forward. How did we build this uh, thing? You know, if, if you really want to build something for the long term, that's not easy. So we need to think about sustainability since day one. You need to be, uh, think about inclusion, openness since day one. So this is what we try to do at the beginning. So on one side, you see on the left of the screen, we brought together many, many different organizations that share this vision. And we have an agreement with UNESCO specifically for preservation and access to the knowledge contained in open source. And, and UNESCO gives a, a, a universal approach to this. There are many testimonials you can find there. So that's important because this means awareness, mind share and building a community. And the, in the right side, you will see the other effort, which is how do you fund this? How do you actually fund this effort in the long term? Well, the first step was to find INRIA, who was, uh, which is a national institute for research in computing in, in France, uh, who was one of the pillar of the W3C, for those of you who remember, which was actually involved in, in, uh, in many, uh, many efforts for the common good, like W3Cs. They accepted to fund the initial part of this work. They are still funding it. They will maintain basic funding for this effort. But from day one, we wanted to open this up to a broader uh, community. So now you see 
the sponsors that we have today, which are actually make donations, these are not industrial contacts, they are donations to the effort, uh, range from very big companies like Intel or Microsoft and banks, the Société Générale. Now we have the Ministry of Research in France that inscribes sort of heritage in the National Plan for Open Science. We have even companies from China like Huawei, so we are really open to work with everybody on a common open project. Then you have universities. You have um, so one university, University of Paris, University of Pisa, University of Bologna. Uh, you have uh, uh, the National Archives in the Netherlands and others which are coming. Okay, uh, more than will be coming right now. There is a lot of space in the blanks here to fill, so do not hesitate if you know somebody who wants to come on board. But I mean, the idea is to have a diverse constituency to ensure we will be there, uh, the effort will be there for the long term. Adoption is coming. Just a few words about this. So we interface with the National Open Access Portal in France, whose code name is HAL, that uh, allows to have a, a curated deposit of source code in sort of heritage. We work with SWMath, a, a beautiful mathematical software indexing service uh, uh, in Germany, in Berlin, actually, at Central Bra, uh, that links code to, to, to the uh, sort of heritage archive. All, all the blue things that you see here are links. If you click there, you will see the examples. Uh, we work with journals. So, for example, image processing online, which is a journal in image processing, uses the bibliotech uh, uh, extension we developed to point to the archive. Uh, the journal of theoretical computation and applied mechanics uh, does the same, and others are coming. And finally, at the policy level, as I mentioned, I mean, so project is now in the officially in French National Plan for Open Science, and we provide self archival guidelines, very simple guidelines for research for archival and reference software. Uh, 25 seconds left before the end of my talk. So let me just bring you some breaking news. Maybe some of you noticed a year ago, Bitbucket, a popular platform, announced that they would phase out mercurial support. This meant to hand a quarter of a million of projects in danger. Okay, so we noticed it. We started work with a company, which is Octobus Expert in Mercurial, with funding coming from a foundation. Uh, and the good news is that now this bitbucketarchive.sotreasure.org is live, so you can already find everything in there. And we, are, we decided to put it immediately available because in July, Bitbucket raised these repositories. And in the coming month, we are going to actually ingest everything into a market tree. And, and people are noticing, you see this tweet here? I mean, uh, one, one researcher had a paper with a pointer in Mercurial depositories in Bitbucket that went away and he just found out that we saved it and he's very happy. Okay, so it's not enough to ask people to deposit. I mean, you really need to be proactive. So I'm finishing now. Conclusion, I hope to convince, to have convinced you that what we do here is building a universal archive with intrinsic identifier, really open non-profit as an infrastructure for open science. And you can help actually uh, uh, in all this undertaking by adopting it, saving the code, contributing to software, just building this community together. Uh, so I will stop here, and if uh, you have any questions, I will be available later on. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to you, uh, Roberto, uh, for this wonderful introduction to the characteristics and pitfalls uh, of, of software archiving and, and research data management in computer science. And uh, of course, thank you for uh, the great work you are doing at Software Heritage. I think we can uh, post the, the link to Software Heritage here in the chat. Um, we would now have five minutes for for immediate questions, but um, maybe people need a bit more time to digest uh, what they have just heard. Uh, so far, I think we don't have any questions. So I would suggest that we uh, continue with uh, the presentation of uh, Michael Gudik and Ulrike Lucke, and then um, have a combined uh, question questionnaire at the end. Or is there, let me check if there's any, no. Okay, so, uh, Ulrike, please, thank you. Okay. Um...
muss noch ausfüllen, wie ich meinen Bildschirm teile. Seht ihr meinen Bildschirm schon? Das Knöpfchen wie vorhin macht nicht mehr dasselbe wie vorhin. Jetzt? Jetzt macht es wieder dasselbe wie vorhin. Danke, Niklas. Okay, ja, um, ganz ja. herzlichen Dank. Um, many thanks, Roberto and Cosmo, for this great presentation. And now don't have to tell what we shall do uh, and can focus on, on how this can be done. Um, für uns liegt ein, ein klarer Weg, um, was wir zu tun haben, um Forschungsdaten in der Informatik nachhaltig nutzbar zu machen, unsere Forschungsergebnisse reproduzierbar, kontrollierbar um, zu machen, damit die Qualität unserer Forschung, ihre Anwendbarkeit letztlich um, zu steigern. Um, dieser Aufgabe widmen wir uns seit mittlerweile fast um, zwei Jahren, was nun mündet in die Einreichung dieses Projektantrages, um, dass wir das tun dürfen bedanken wir einem GWK-Beschluss äh, bzw. einer Bund-Länder-Vereinbarung, die 2018 beschlossen wurde, wo es eben darum ging, nationale Forschungsdateninfrastruktur aufzubauen. Das heißt also quer ähm, über Deutschland, aber sortiert nach einzelnen Fächern solche Infrastrukturen zu bauen, wie wir sie eben äh, am Beispiel gesehen haben. Ähm, was wir bislang dazu ähm, schon getan haben, ist uns unsere Absicht zu erklären, das auch für die Informatik zu tun. Das heißt also, wir haben an den ähm, Konferenzen, die zu diesem Thema von der DFG organisiert wurden, teilgenommen, haben Absichtserklärungen abgegeben, auch eine verbindliche Absichtserklärung, dass wir in diesem Jahr ähm, einen solchen Antrag einreichen wollen. Sie sehen hier den, den Screenshot mal von der Coverseite. Das ist nicht hochgradig spektakulär. Wie gesagt, der Weg, der vor uns liegt, ist eigentlich relativ klar beschrieben. Das heißt, diese, ich glaube, es waren 23 Seiten Text von dem Letter of Intent, bestehen letztlich aus fünf Seiten, die inhaltlich beschreiben, was wir tun möchten. Und der Rest ist die Auflistung der Mitglieder des Konsortiums, möglichen Befangenheiten, die für Begutachtung bestehen und so weiter. Das heißt, was ich damit sagen will, ist, dass es auch eine sehr, sehr große organisatorische Aufgabe ist, nicht nur zu wissen, was getan werden muss, sondern dafür zu sorgen, dass es getan werden kann und dass auch die Ergebnisse unseres Tuns hinterher der gesamten Informatik-Community zur Verfügung stehen. Der nicht so wichtige Schritt für uns, Sie sehen das hier unten nochmal von der DFG-Webseite, ist der 30. September, das ist heute, wo wir diesen ähm, riesengroßen Antrag dann einreichen werden. Wir müssen noch ein bisschen polieren oder an der einen oder anderen Stelle, aber ähm, grundsätzlich steht dieser Antrag und deswegen will ich Ihnen heute auch ein bisschen daraus erzählen, was wir da getan haben bzw. beabsichtigen zu tun. Vorher vielleicht noch ein kurzer Blick auf die Konsortien, die bereits gestartet sind. Das ist so ein dreistufiger Prozess. In 2020 wurden bis jetzt neun Konsortien ausgewählt. Das sind die, die Sie hier sehen, die schon jetzt eine Förderzusage bekommen haben und sich jetzt bereit machen, wirklich zu starten. In 2021 sollen nochmal und in 2022 nochmal welche hinzukommen. Und wir hoffen, dass wir in der kommenden Runde eben mit unserem Antrag Dabei sind. Ich habe Ihnen hier einmal ein beispielhaftes äh, Coverfoto äh, eines Antrags gezeigt und hier jetzt der nicht ganz aktuellste, aber ein relativ aktueller Stand unseres ähm, Coverfotos. Ich bin unwahrscheinlich stolz darauf, dass auf unserem Titelblatt kein Computer zu sehen ist, keine Nullen und keine Einsen zu sehen sind, sondern dass dort Menschen drauf sind. Denn damit unterstreichen wir nochmal das, was uns auch Roberto Di Cosmo eben als Botschaft mitgegeben hat. Ähm, Forschungsdaten nachhaltig ähm, zu halten, wiederverwendbar zu machen, ist eine Frage von Menschen, von Community ähm, und weniger eine ausschließliche Technikfrage. Natürlich gehen wir die Technik trotzdem an, das ist klar. Ähm, wer sind diese ganzen Gesichter? Die konnten Sie vielleicht alle auf die Schnelle gar nicht so erkennen in diesem Wimmelbild. Deswegen sind Sie hier mal aufgelistet. Sie sehen, das ist viel. Das können Sie nicht alles lesen. Ähm, sollen Sie auch gar nicht alles lesen, aber ich will vielleicht ganz kurz das kommentieren. Ähm, was Sie sehen, ist links eine Liste der sogenannten Co-Applicants. Das sind diejenigen, die wirklich nennenswert Funding über diese Initiative bekommen, die aber im Gegenzug auch mit einer deutlichen Eigenleistung dort reingehen müssen. So Pi mal Daumen 20 bis 50 Prozent des Fundings nochmal als Eigenleistung in Personen oder in Infrastruktur, die eingebracht wird in, in, in dieses Vorhaben, bringen diese Leute mit. Auf der rechten Seite sehen Sie die sogenannten Participants, die kriegen weniger Funding. Da ist eher sowas mal wie Reisekosten oder eine WHK dabei. Ähm, dafür braucht man aber eben auch keine eigenen Beiträge zu erbringen. 
in finanzieller Hinsicht, sondern gibt eben seine Expertise, seine Erfahrung, seine, seine Netzwerke ähm, oder ähnliches äh, mit in dieses Konsortium ähm, hinein. Unterm Strich haben wir jetzt also bei den Co-Applicants 22 Personen von 18 verschiedenen Einrichtungen, die sozusagen als Antragsteller fungieren. Und auf der rechten Liste haben wir, wenn, wenn ich richtig gezählt habe, 27 Einzelpersonen und dann noch einmal vier Institutionen, ähm, die hier ähm, mit beitragen. Was haben wir mit dieser großen Menge gemacht? Das war bisweilen wie ein Sack Flummelhüten, aber als Mama kann man sowas. Deswegen ein kurzer Einblick in unsere inhaltliche Arbeit der letzten, insbesondere Wochen. Was wir getan haben, ist uns unsere Community anzuschauen, wie sie denn funktioniert. Das kann keiner von uns in voller Breite übersehen. Ich stopp beispielsweise stamme ursprünglich aus der technischen Informatik, habe mich dann ähm, über die Mensch-Maschine-Interaktion hin zum E-Learning entwickelt, kann also in diese drei Felder relativ gut reinschauen. Aber der ganze große Rest der Informatik ist mir nicht fremd, aber auch nicht so vertraut, dass ich wirklich im Detail beschreiben könnte, was dort eigentlich passiert, wo die Bedürfnisse liegen. Deswegen haben wir quer durch unsere Community Steckbriefe erbeten, haben dafür auch die GI-Strukturen genutzt und die Leute gebeten zu beschreiben, was macht ihr denn da? Was ist der Kerngedanke hinter eurer Teildisziplin? Welche Daten fallen da so an? Kann man die irgendwie kategorisieren? Und vor allen Dingen, was macht ihr dann mit diesen Daten? Welche besonderen Erfordernisse sind an das Handling ähm, dieser Daten zu stellen, beispielsweise mit Blick auf Privacy, mit Blick auf ähm, Sicherheitsaspekte, äh, rechtliche Aspekte. Ähm, wie, wie kriegt ihr das nachnutzbar? Diese ganzen Steckbriefe sind dann ein riesengroßer Haufen Text gewesen, ein bisschen strukturiert und damit haben wir gearbeitet. Das können Sie sich so ähnlich vorstellen, äh, wie wenn man ein Softwareprodukt entwerfen will und mit seinem Kunden spricht und lässt ihn erstmal beschreiben, was er macht und versucht dann irgendwie zu extrahieren, was da drin steckt. Zum Beispiel, wenn wir ein ER-Modell aufstellen wollen, haben wir alle mal im Studium gelernt, dann achten wir auf die Substantive in dem Text, die wären so potenziell vielleicht mal irgendeine Klasse. Dann achten wir auf die Verben in dem Text, die wären vielleicht mal eine Methode und die Adjektive wären vielleicht ein Attribut in diesem Modell. So ähnlich sind wir an diese Texte auch rangegangen. Das heißt, wir haben geguckt, wo stecken da die Kernbegriffe drin, wo liegt, liegen die immer wiederkehrenden Aspekte, die für uns aus dieser Perspektive Forschungsdatenmanagement relevant sind. Das haben wir markiert und dann in, in ein iterativ wachsendes Codebuch überführt. Das ist das, was Sie hier rechts sehen, wo wir dann geguckt haben, okay, welche Begriffe tauchen auf, welche sind ähnlich, die muss man vielleicht zusammenfassen und dann als einen und denselben Code verstehen. Wie kann man das wieder unterteilen in, das ist ein Ziel, das ist ein bestehendes Defizit, das ist eine Maßnahme, die man konkret ergreifen könnte. Auf diese Art und Weise haben wir iterativ unser Codebuch aufgebaut und, und gleichzeitig mit diesen Steckbriefen praktisch gearbeitet, sodass jetzt sowas herausgekommen ist wie kodierte Steckbriefe. Die will ich Ihnen jetzt nicht im Einzelnen alle zeigen, das sind insgesamt elf Steckbriefe von verschiedenen Disziplinen, aber ich habe Ihnen mal einen Ausschnitt mitgebracht. Beim Lesen sieht man gleich, da geht es in die theoretische Informatik, da hatte ich vorher ganz wenig zu sagen können. Und hier ist ein Steckbrief, wo wir dann in die textuelle Beschreibung, die wir bekommen haben, sowas eingefügt haben, wie diese Kürzel, dass es hier beispielsweise um Metadaten geht oder dass Versionierung wichtig ist und so weiter und so fort. Sie sehen da schon verschiedene Buchstaben davor, vor diesen Kürzeln, die so ein bisschen eine Kategorisierung der einzelnen Aspekte andeuten. Das sind also mehrere Dutzend Seiten in unserem Antrag, die sich diesem empirischen Aufarbeiten unserer Forschungsarbeit in der Informatik widmen. Und was dabei herausgekommen ist, sind diese den jeweils einzelnen Kürzeln und ihren Kategorisierungen als, Sie sehen das hier, S, oder D oder C, äh, ähm, entsprechende Grobarchitektur. Ähm, diese Grobarchitektur, sehen Sie hier, haben wir in drei Layer, informatiktypisch ähm, unterteilt. Auf der untersten Ebene alles, was irgendwie mit dem Handling von Daten ganz primär zu tun hat. Auf der mittleren Ebene die Services, die man aufbauend auf diese Daten dann technisch bereitstellen muss. Und ganz oben den Community Layer, wo es irgendwie darum geht, ähm, noch ähm, den, den, den Output ähm, dieser Services oder ihrer Benutzung insbesondere auch ähm, nochmal zu, ähm, zu verbessern. Ähm, diese einzelnen Kästchen bilden dann unsere sogenannten Task Areas im NFTI-Sprechen. Man könnte auch Arbeitspakete dazu sagen. 
Ähm, das heißt also, wir haben dann Arbeitspakete, die sich damit widmen, dass Daten versioniert werden können, wie wir das eben zum Beispiel gesehen haben. Dass es Metadaten dazu gibt, Austauschprotokolle, die diese Daten beschreiben und benutzbar zugreifbar machen. Dass die Bedeutung hinter diesen Metadaten in ähm, ähm, interoperablen ähm, Vokabular beschrieben ist, die semantischen Aspekte und so weiter und so fort. Ich will da nicht im Einzelnen alles durchgehen. Das langweilt Sie vielleicht, beziehungsweise Sie können sich hinterher das natürlich auch noch mal äh, im Detail ähm, zu Gemüte ziehen. Ähm, vielleicht noch wieder ein Wort dazu, wie wir das dann sortiert haben, damit da wirklich ähm, ein beschreibbares Projekt herauskommt. Das ist ja jetzt erstmal nur die inhaltliche Perspektive. Wir haben uns dann all die ganzen Namen, die Sie vorhin auf dieser ganz klein gedruckten Folie gesehen haben, genommen und die Leute gebeten, sich zuzusortieren in großen Tabellen. Sie sehen hier nur einen kleinen Ausschnitt, nämlich ähm, spaltenweise die ähm, Datenebene. Da schließen sich also noch die sieben Punkte der Serviceebene und die sieben Punkte der Community-Ebene nach rechts weg an. Und nach unten hin sehen Sie auch wieder nur ausschnittweise die Teildisziplinen der Informatik, die wir hier mit ähm, verarbeitet haben, sodass sich also so eine Kreuzmatrix ergibt, wo dann jeder gesagt hat, okay, für das und das Thema äh, wäre ich bereit, Expertise oder auch wirklich Arbeitsleistung einzubringen in die Task Area sowieso. Und aus dieser dann relativ gut befüllten Matrix, wie ich finde, haben wir dann geschaut, okay, wer von den Leuten, die jetzt in einer Spalte stehen, setzt sich den Hut auf? Wer wird ähm, Task Area Leader ähm, und koordiniert dann mit all den Menschen, die da jetzt unter ihm in derselben Spalte stehen, ähm, dass dieses Arbeitspaket wirklich angegangen ist? Nochmal präziser fassen, welche Ziele sind damit ganz im Einzelnen verbunden? Welche Maßnahmen müssen wir ergreifen, um diese Ziele zu erreichen? Und letztlich, ganz schnöde, was kostet uns das? Äh, diesen Aushandlungsprozess haben wir in den letzten Wochen abgeschlossen, sodass wir jetzt dastehen mit einem Antrag der, wie gesagt, noch ein bisschen poliert werden muss ähm, und den wir einreichen wollen heute. Ähm, und damit der, die Euphorie vielleicht noch ein bisschen gedämpft ist, habe ich Ihnen hier die Liste, die auf der DFG-Webseite veröffentlicht ist, reinkopiert, welche anderen Konsortien auch in 2020 beantragen wollen. Und wenn Sie da mal gucken, das ist nicht wenig, das ist gewiss mehr, als am Ende gefördert wird. Das heißt, neben dem, dass wir hoffentlich einen guten Job gemacht haben, muss das natürlich auch das Gutachtergremium so sehen, da müssen wir Sie einfach ganz herzlich bitten, uns die Daumen zu drücken. Ähm ja, damit wäre ich am Ende meiner Präsentation. Michael, ich habe dir gar nicht richtig viel übrig gelassen, was zu sagen. <lacht> Alles gut, hast du sehr schön gemacht. Und ein, ein, vielleicht noch kurz eben halt auch die Beziehung zu dem Vortrag von Roberto Di Cosmo an dieser Stelle. Natürlich ist die Informatik keine isolierte Insel in Deutschland, sondern wir werden sozusagen auch innerhalb der, des NFDI ähm, äh, Ansatzes der DFG bzw. Der, 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 der Bundesregierung ist ja eben halt ein, ein nicht, nicht ein primäres Projekt der DFG, sondern äh, die DFG verwaltet das auf, äh, äh, im Auftrag der, der sogenannten GWK, also der, Wissen, der gemeinsamen Gewissen, wissenschaftlichen Kommission von Bund und Ländern. Und insbesondere Informatik ist international. Wir, wir haben eben halt auch einen wesentlichen Teil unserer Ressourcen, stecken wir da rein, dass wir eben halt auch äh, unsere ähm, äh, Fühler ausstrecken in äh, alle Richtungen, äh, national und international, um eben halt hier ein interoperables und verteiltes Informationssystem zu haben, wo die Software Heritage Foundation, ähm, äh, mein Wunsch wäre, dass eben halt eine große Rolle spielt, äh, weil eben halt dort viele interessante und wichtige Vorarbeiten schon gemacht worden sind. Und wie wir das dann gen gerne ergänzen würden, wäre dann eben halt ein Teil dieser Arbeiten, also die internationale Verbindung zu weiteren Fachgesellschaften, zu weiteren Communities oder Teilen der Community, die eben halt in anderen Ländern auch positioniert sind, ist ein ganz, ganz wichtiger Teil für unsere Arbeit hier. Und das wird eben halt, also das ist alles beschrieben in dem Antrag, also eben halt ein wichtiger, eine Task Area ist eben halt auch internationale Verbindungen herzustellen. Also das äh, äh, hier nochmal zur Ergänzung und von daher eben halt, äh, ja, Daumen drücken äh, ist äh, wichtig, weil man braucht ein bisschen Glück beim, äh, beim Auswahlprozess und äh, das hoffen wir, dass wir das äh, haben und äh, da an der Stelle eben halt dann mit den, glaube ich, sehr wichtigen Arbeiten für die Informatik, äh, die, äh, was wir auch erreicht haben, ist eben halt, dass die Communities, die wir angesprochen haben, auch tatsächlich kooperieren bei diesen äh, Themen, die wir identifiziert haben und äh, da sind wir auch schon ein bisschen drauf stolz und können das auch als, als ein Ergebnis des Antragsschreiben werten, dass wir eben halt hier 
tatsächlich äh, Communities innerhalb der Informatik schon zusammengebracht haben, die, glaube ich, vorher eher selten miteinander geredet haben, sagen wir mal so. Ne? Also das ist äh, äh, zum Abschluss eben halt äh, auch nochmal einen großen Dank an alle äh, Mitstreiterinnen und Mitstreiter, die eben halt hier geholfen haben, das an, äh, sozusagen als Antrag zum Fliegen zu bringen. Das war schon eine anstrengende Zeit, die letzten äh, paar Monate. Und äh, ja, dann drücken wir die Daumen, dass jetzt nicht noch die Technik zusammenbricht und <lacht> wir den Antrag noch anreichen können. Ein Teil der Informationen stehen schon im, im, im DFG-Werkzeug für die Antragstellung. Aber äh, den Text müssen wir natürlich noch hochladen. Das ist noch nicht äh, passiert. Okay, dann würde ich jetzt hier an dieser Stelle aufhören zu sprechen und ähm, bin gespannt auf Ihre Fragen und, und Kommentare. Hm? Ja, danke auch äh, euch beiden. Uh, Roberto, um, could, you, could you please enable your uh, video sharing? I'm not able sure. to do that. No? Perfect. So okay. we are back again and um, in, uh, in the meantime, people have Uh, reflected on your talk, and um, we have we have two questions uh, re regarding your presentation, uh, Roberto. Um, okay. First, uh, Mr. Klana, uh, Klammer asked um, a question about long-term archival. Are there similar ideas like the GitHub, uh, like the GitHub Ar Arctic Vault uh, for softwareheritage.org? Uh, yes, well, okay, this uh, GitHub uh, archive program is something which has been launched in no last November. I was actually at GitHub Universe for the event. We are a partner with the GitHub with the effort they are making. Uh, well, you know, archiving something on microfilm in the Arctic world is very nice as an advertisement uh, operation, as a, as, let's say, publicity stunt. Uh, I'm not sure this is what I have, I would have done, okay, if I, if I were in their feet, because uh, uh, who is going to access this stuff uh, when? I mean, it's, it's really a very last, last resort. I mean, in case everybody dies, etc. at this point, what do you do with that? It's not very clear. So we have, of course, long-term plans for uh, archiving everything of, of, which is in the software edge of the car, which is not just GitHub, it's much more than that. Uh, but this is more medium term in the sense uh, um, partnering with the uh, national archives for example in france we have a national archive that stores data for uh, research in a very long term using the oais standard and uh, all, all these kind of different things on on, uh, on tapes for example uh, and this is in progress it will take time Uh, I imagine you, for example, in Germany, I'm sure you have also National Archive for Digital Data in the same way. You could do exactly the same thing in different places. So I believe more in replication of different places than in just a single potential mm -hmm. point of data. Um, and, and in the meantime, it is very important that we keep all of this software available because You never know what part of software you might be interested in. Even software from the 60s can be interesting and you need to access it now. So you need to have the, the data live. If you do studies, for example, from on the evolution of the practice of programming over the past 50 years, you cannot have part of your data on tape. You need to have everything available for running massive analysis right today. So it's a several layer. So time to have everything available for all of you right away then having a mirror program to make sure we don't lose the data now, then having another layer which is based on national archive, which are already structured to have long-term archival, to see how regularly taking snapshot of what is in software heritage. I mean, not all of this is already existing today. It requires time, requires collaboration, requires funding, requires an effort, but it's definitely in, in the roadmap we, we should all be building together. Thank you. Um, we have we have two more questions uh, referring to your talk. Um, maybe if you are to the audience, if you want to ask questions about uh, Ulrike's and uh, Michael's talk, please also feel free to to ask them. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, maybe Roberto, you could um, answer these two other questions, um, Miss. Nusbik is asking, uh, do you know open source as prior art in 
an initiative of uh, USPTO and Linux, your project might be interesting for patent offices. Um, and maybe you, you can combine this. Uh, Ms. Rehm asked, um, is there already a cooperation between Software Heritage and the CSER task force, Open Science? CSER is capitalized. It's an acronym, apparently. Well, okay, so we'll take each of them in turn. Uh, about, yes, about this issue about prior art, yes. Very, very uh, good point. Actually, this kind of archive, as, as we have the source code, looking at the source code, you can find prior art in many different cases, of course. But to do this properly, you need tools that we do not have yet today, okay, because you need to be able to find among billions of source code files some which are relevant for a particular kind of application and with precise timestamp. But we have one thing which is a timestamp. So you can say this file was made publicly available in 1989. Then if it happens to contain an implementation of an algorithm or an approach has been patented later on, that's prior art and it's definitely, definitely one application. We have already been contacted by people interested in that, but we need more technology to, for this to actually be actionable. Maybe machine learning, maybe massive data analysis. So it, it, it's a fantastic playground for, for doing research, let, let me say. Not, not for me, not for my team, for you. Okay, let, just go ahead and do it. it. It's fantastic. Very good point. Now, I didn't really understand. Caesar uh, in Open Science, another initiative which is codenamed what? I didn't. Uh, CISA is uh, a European cooperation of technical universities. Uh, Ms. Rim writes, they have an, a very active task force on open science. Uh, no, uh, I am not in touch with them. I do not know. If, if there is a way of making a connection, I would be very grateful for uh, the, to the person that actually bring, brought this up. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe you can uh, write us an email and, and I can forwarded to uh, Mr. Di Cosmo. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so just trying to get hold of all the windows on my screen, but so far I don't see any other questions. So maybe um, to, to close this workshop, maybe uh, you, you three have uh, another uh, few words on how uh, NFDXCS um, will cooperate with, with Software Heritage or what, what, yeah, what, what will be the um, contribution of Software Heritage to mm. NFDI, uh, NFDI XCS, complicated acronym. <laughs> um, yeah, you already uh, said a few words on this, but maybe some closing remarks. Uh, who wants to start? Mm, maybe maybe I, I I just start a little bit by by um, characterizing the few links. Oh, no, not not a few links. Uh, many links we have to software heritage here. Um, of course, uh, software as a as a first uh, type of citizen is is a research issue of software engineering, and we have uh, of course a profile of software engineering within uh, our uh, set of profiles in in computer science, research profiles in computer science, and and uh, of, as you said, um, mining software repositories is uh, an important aspect of that, and uh, we we try to link researchers uh, in the field with with software heritage because it's it's a beautiful and a uh, very relevant uh, archive of software and uh, that, that's certainly a, a big point and uh, we would like to use uh, of course uh, uh, the archive as well and um, not part of nfdi cross cs uh, i will um, uh, talk to people and have started that already to um, sure. convince and persuade people to make um, uh, to make a similar effort as in italy uh, as and and in the netherlands to make a, a living copy of uh, of uh, the software heritage, um, we, we can't fund this within NFDI cross CS, uh, but uh, that that's certainly uh, an additional um, and uh, very useful uh, bit of work uh, I, I would like to do and pursue in the next uh, couple of months. 
Um, uh, of course, publication is very important. Uh, um, one important motivation and uh, aspect of NFDI cross CS is uh, to make publication processes better. And an ingredient is citation of software and data. Uh, data comes always with software, so this is linked together. That's it's one um, uh, important topic of, of ours, that uh, software and data needs to come together as uh, also we believe and we think in other disciplines of research and science as well. But uh, we are talking uh, for and, and with uh, computer science here and, and for, for us it's clear that we have to have a, a very robust and um, a way to, uh, to cite uh, software and, um, and data. And you have done a great uh, work here already and we would like to link to that. And, uh, try to um, uh, use it, uh, complement it, and do also a little bit of research in that area, not as part of NFDI cross CS, but uh, that is a kind of uh, collateral damage <laughs> that we have uh, uh, research uh, efforts supported here as well. So that, that, that these are two very important links we, we see here and um, uh, looking forward to, to work with you in, in this respect. Maybe Ulrike, you might complement this a little bit. Okay. I'm fine with yes. this. Thanks, Michael. I, I really, first of all, I would really say, like to say thank you because you reached out uh, a few months ago. I was not aware of the initiative you are bringing, uh, you know, Sheffield in now, which is, I think, is extremely important and delighted to see you in Germany moving forward the way I would like to see people here in France to do. But so, so I, I wish you the best of luck in, in, in going here. And my message is really we are together building an infrastructure which is essential, yeah. not just for our discipline, for, for mankind. Think of what we are going through right now. I mean, this virus, etc. this is a big challenge we didn't expect. There will be more. Uh, you can have an asteroid crashing out here or a, or a computer virus going wild or chemical issue, or any kind of things. And we never know where we will find the tools to, to face these challenges. Mm -hmm. The tools we have are, is knowledge and collaboration and building an open infrastructure that allows us without limits, without barriers to share knowledge, to better find the tools we need to face this challenge is of paramount importance, not just for computer science. It is important for mankind in general. So, my, my deepest wish is to see us building a global collaboration to build this kind of infrastructure. So Rachel is a piece of it. Okay, mm -hmm. so to see, I could have designed this infrastructure as a purely a personal project funded in a, just an institution to say, this is mine, look, this is beautiful, it is mine. <laughs> I don't know how good I am, but this is mine. No, it has been built from the day one to be open to absolutely everybody, because I believe we need common infrastructure. Yeah. So we have so many things to do. The, the effort you are making, the effort we try to do, going to the level of your, the European Union, the, you, you see that there have been funding made available for many kind of infrastructure. Let's try to convince them that we need a European effort, and even more than European effort, we need a global effort to go there. But mm -hmm. let's start. Yeah. Before we can. Okay, very good. I think this, these are famous last words for this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Roberto. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us the honor here. Thank uh, all of you uh, for your passion on this uh, topic of, of research data management. And uh, good luck with the last steps of the uh, proposal. And um, if there were any questions that we couldn't answer during this talk, or I, I saw that some questions um, were posed just a second ago, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to us. Um, there's uh, NFDE cross or xcs.org, uh, the website, and you will find all contact information there. Thank you again. And uh, the, 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 the slides available, and we send it to you, Nicolas, right? So anybody who wants a copy of the slides or the presentation will have a copy. Okay, thank you. That's what that um are we allowed to put it on the website then? And absolutely, no problem. No, okay, nothing. Very good. absolutely. So we will mention it on the website that you gave the talk and uh, the slides as well. Thank you very much. Hmm? Perfect. And um all of you uh being part of the informatic uh 2020 program, um have a wonderful 
uh, rest of the day and uh, yeah, see you in a different talk. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Roberto, take care. See you soon. Bye bye. Yes, bye. Awesome. <laughs>